Don't click that remote. Don't change anything because if you do, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show because our guest tonight is Paul Kersey. He's the director of labor policy at the Illinois Policy Institute. We're taping this on June 4th and we're waiting breathlessly for a Supreme Court case that involves Illinois, involves Governor Pat Quinn. Probably it's going to come down, I think, next Monday, which would be June 9th or Monday, June 16th or very soon. Look, it's really key stuff. This is like a story of an individual who's robbed of her dignity. Really? Would Governor Pat Quinn do that? Would unions do that to this nice young lady who's doing nothing, uh, trying to, striving to do well and take care of her son? Oh no, if you click the remote, you're going to miss that and much, much more. So don't click that remote because if you do, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show. You're watching Public Affairs. As I promised, as I promised, our guest tonight is Paul Kersey. He is Director of Labor Policy at the Illinois Policy Institute. Look, when start, people start talking about labor, they start talking about like management and they talk about, oh, you know, like the, the labor, the employee, the plaintiffs and all that. We're going to skip right to it. We're going to go right to the Pam Harris case. Paul Kersey, why should people care about Pam Harris? Well, Pam Hill Harris is a mom. Uh, first and foremost. Uh, that's the one thing people need to, to keep it keep straight about this. There's been a lot of distortion around there. Unions in particular have tried to portray her as if she's a state employee. But she really is a mom. She's taking care of her son, Josh. Uh, Josh suffers from a rare genetic defect uh, that leaves him uh, mentally and physically handicapped. And he requires pretty close to around the clock care, which, which uh, Pamela Harris gives to him. And Pamela uh, relies on the state for a, for, a, for a small amount of support, somewhere around the neighborhood of $20,000 a year. Now, Not a whole lot. When you say the state, you mean the state of Illinois? State of Illinois, And yeah. where does Pamela Harris live? Uh, suburban Chicago. Suburban Chicago. Okay. Mm -hmm. She's just a mom. Yeah. Basically, basically, she's just a mom. She's not like an entrepreneur. She's certainly not doing this for the money. Okay. And, uh, and the, uh, a few years ago, uh, Governor Patrick Quinn uh, signed an executive order basically saying that uh, she and, and thousands of families uh, across Illinois, very much like her, could be unionized. And the Service Employees International Union has been trying very hard to, 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 to sort of impose a union on these people. Uh, there is another group of people very like her, uh, slightly different program, very similar situations though, uh, who have been unionized. And they've been forced to pay union dues. The, the SEIU is collecting $10 million a year off of these groups. Uh, so it's a, it's a big money spinner for the unions, but uh, it's not appropriate for Pam Harris. She's not a state employee. She's a mom taking care of her, uh, of her son. And uh, she does not want the union around. Uh, most of the parents like her do not want the want the union around, and the union really just doesn't make much sense for them. And how, how many parents are there like Pam Harris that the union is trying? Would it be fair to say they're trying to force her to join a union? It would be, yeah, that would be a, that be, would be a fair way to describe it. And how many of these parents are there like that, like Pam Harris? There are about twenty thousand. Twenty thousand, mm -hmm. and mostly they're individual parents who are not receiving much, if anything, to take care of their kids. They're just doing that because. It's their kid, right? Right. That, that's they're not. They're not for hire. They may, like anybody else, get some assistance from the state. Right. But it's not like the state hired Jeff Berkowitz and say, "Go take care of this kid," who you don't know. No. These are parents taking care of their kids, mm -hmm. receiving some financial assistance. So if you're at home, folks, just so you understand this, you've got a kid, and so you're taking care of your kid. Maybe your kid's got a cold. Maybe your kid's got a severe disease. You're taking care of it, of your, of your child, your daughter, your son. And Pat Quinn comes in and says, oh, you have to join a union? That's kind of what's happening here? That's, that's basically what happened. Uh, Governor Quinn and the union basically justified this on the grounds that, look, they are getting, uh, they are getting a stipend from the state uh, that's kind of connected to the number of hours that they work. Uh, they are arguing, apparently, that Caring for uh, the disabled children is primarily the state's job, not the parents' job. In fact, they, they're doing it. They could try to send their kid to an institution, which yeah. would cost the state. Mm -hmm. But they love their kids so much, they're foregoing the opportunity to work in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, they're working for their kid, but they're not really doing that for the money. To the extent they receive a stipend, it's somewhat offsetting the income they lost by staying home yeah. to care for their child. That's about right. And they're probably 
the stipends probably way less than many of these people could make in the marketplace. I'd right? have to imagine yeah. that, uh, that, that Pamela Harris could, could earn more than $20,000 a year uh, working full time uh, as, a, as any, I don't know, as a teacher, as a manager, whatever. So how does Governor Quinn get involved? Because people are wondering, because we're taping this on June 4th, the year 2014. We're about five months away from when people will have an opportunity to go to the ballot box to go and decide between Bruce Rauner, the Republican nominee for governor, mm -hmm. Pat Quinn, the Democratic nominee for re-election. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think Pat would say if I said, Pat, why, why don't you just let this wom poor woman be, or these 20,000 poor parents be? Why would you interfere with their right to do this without joining the union? What do you suppose Pat would Governor say? Governor Quinn would probably say something along the lines of, Pamela Harris is an employee. She needs a union there to make sure she's treated fairly. Uh, and you know, and and go from there. They would assume that she's an employee, and then just go from there to to give the usual union rationale. A mom is an employee. Now, Pat. Now, I don't know his whole family situation. I understand he's divorced. I think he's got an adult <laughs> son. He was married once. Okay. Now, Pat, if I walked up to you, Governor Quinn, and said, "You know, your son, who you were taking care of, you were really an employee. We should have unionized you so you could have taken care of your son." That would be the analogy, right? Well, I don't sort want to of. personalize it too much, Pat, but you know, it's kind of a personal situation. Well, Governor Quinn would probably would probably say, "I'm playing devil's advocate, as you can tell. I, I have too much hair to be Pat Quinn." Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, That's kind of a shot. The, he would Pat's probably. Pat's very proud. No, I just got to intersect because sometimes I've been at press conferences and Pat said he was a little late because he was at the barber before and he said he <laughs> made quick dispatch. Okay. So Pat is a good guy and he could kid about his own hair. Okay. I've said, Pat, we could sometimes take shots at you, but everybody knows you're a quite likable guy. Anyway, Pat Quinn would probably say, well, I wasn't actually getting paid by the state for, for this. He would, he is trying to, uh, to portray the, uh, the support that Pamela Harris and her family get to care for Josh as a salary. And that's the- He was trying the, to portray it. He's trying to portray it as a salary. Kind of a stretch. Yeah. But why again, why did he do it? Doesn't Pat wants people to like him. Pam mm -hmm. Harris probably doesn't like Pat too much at this point, right? Those 20,000 parents who Pat wants to force to join a union they don't want to join, mm -hmm. they don't like him. Why would Pat, I mean, he's like everybody else who's running for office. You want people to like you, and then they'll vote for you. Well, so I'm just trying to explain mm -hmm. it to me. If I'm sitting there at home, I might say, I don't get this. Why would Pat do something that 20,000 people aren't going to like? Well, uh, to coin a phrase, follow the money. Uh, the SEIU collects about $10 million a, a year in uh, union dues from the, uh, from the group that they did organize. Uh, that's $10 million that goes to the union uh, that... Uh, that now, are, most of these of people, are most of these people real employees, not like parents and so forth? In this particular group, uh, the one that most gets, of these gets are going to be, million dollars. Most of these, yeah, most of these people are actually parents like No, but in the, in the group Pamela that Martin. give him, in the group that gives him yeah. $10 million, that yeah. gives the union $10 million, right. those people are also parents? Most of them are. Really? The overwhelming majority, something like three quarters. And how many parents are there? In, is that the uh, 20,000? That, that would be about 20,000. Okay, so that's the 20. So these 20,000 parents that we're talking about, he already gets... The union already gets $10 million in yeah. dues from them, but th if they force Pamela Harris and others to join, they're going to get $2 million more in dues? Something like that, yeah. That's, from that's some of right. those 20,000 mm -hmm. are going to have to pay higher dues, is that it? Well, it's, it, her group is, is, is a smaller group. It's only about five or 6,000 people. Oh, so with that five or 6,000 yeah. in dues still gives another them $2 million? Yeah. Boy, this union stuff's big money. Yeah, there's a lot 5, of money. 5,000, $2 million. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there's uh, union dues are not cheap. They're... Uh, they start. They can but go anywhere from four hundred so to a thousand dollars. I don't quite get this. I'm watching at home. Now you've said why the union wants to do this, but why does Pat want to do this? Because he may lose twenty thousand votes, right? Well, he may lose twenty thousand votes, but he, he can't get? guarantee that he would have gained them all. Does anyway. he get anything out of this? Well, the uh, SEIU is in a position to uh, to spend that money pretty much however they want to, oh. and they can reward their friends, punish their enemies. Uh, Who would Pat some Quinn, of their friends be? Pat Quinn might be one of their friends. Oh, so he would be like a Democratic politician who supports SEIU, mm -hmm. and SEIU turns around and supports Pat. It's like, you wash my back, I'll wash yours. Yeah. yeah that's, 
Uh, I mean, look, uh, the the well, SEIU probably would would didn't support Pat Quinn either go way. Go to jail for that because he was like trying to sell a Senate seat. So is Pat trying to sell his power as governor, his executive order that compels people to join this union? Is Pat selling that in the same way Rod was selling the Senate seat? I would stop short of that. I, okay. I would say that uh, that Pat Quinn, Pat Quinn probably uh, probably just looked at the situation and said. Here's a group that uh, that I support. They've supported me in the past. There probably wasn't any explicit quid pro quo. Uh, there wasn't any explicit tri yeah. trade anyway. But certainly there's a there's a, there's an expectation. I, I would certainly not be surprised if there was an expectation on Patrick Quinn's uh, part that said, you know what, if I can figure out a way to get ten mil a couple extra million dollars to the SEIU. I might see a piece of that. Well, we, if we looked it up, you may know, how much do you think SEIU has given to Pat in campaign contributions in the past? Any ballpark figure? Oh, uh, I, 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 it's been a while since I looked at the exact figures, but if, but uh, probably several hundred thousand dollars, maybe Seven close to a million. million dollars. So that can translate to a lot of votes, because if you have a million dollars, you can do TV ads and mm -hmm. so forth, so you can both get new votes and get your vote out. So that's kind of what's happening here, because Pat can't really justify this else other than he needs the money, right? Uh, well, I, I mean, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, whether this is a good deal for uh, for parents, it's it's awful hard for the, for him to justify it on those terms. Yeah, and so now what happened? The Pam Harris, you saying somebody once showed up at her doorstep, a few sort of tough-looking guys, and said, "Kind of, we want you to join the union, sign this card." It was called card check, right? Yeah, they were uh, they were trying to get uh, parents like Pamela Harris to to join the union. Now, I don't remember if it was particular. I, I Pamela Harris told me about this. I don't remember that they were specifically tough looking people. What yeah. I do remember, she said, is I that remember they were they sort, sort of, of tricking burly. Them. I was heard. I heard one. I read something about one guy being kind of burly. Okay. I thought. Okay. Well, the the first visit, maybe yeah. maybe we're maybe we're getting our visits confused. Yeah. Along the, the way, the first visit was a couple. Of, a couple. Yeah. The, the first visit was a couple of very nice young people. Yeah. Who, uh, if I remember right, she, she said uh, they were. They tried to convince her that they needed her to sign this card so that they could go back to their supervisor and prove that they had visited her and met ah. with her. So did Pam sign that card? No, she no. didn't sign any cards. Right. Uh, so they started off with uh, with trick with Tricky. trickeration. They didn't really do that. They were trying to get her to sign something that they could use to show she's supporting the union. Yes, that's the the whole point. They of were the hoping the she card wouldn't yep. read. She, we were hoping she wouldn't read what really was said. Not very closely, anyway. Yeah. Okay. So she didn't do that, and then what happened? Well, uh, the the union uh, tried a couple of other times. Apparently, the main thing was they did manage to get enough people to sign those cards uh, to uh, to force a vote. Uh, it was kind of uh, kind of messy, actually. The uh, the uh, the Ask Me Union also got uh -huh. involved, and because of the because of the the uh, the conflict between the SEIU and Ask Me, they had to uh, to to schedule a, a free a secret ballot vote. So in the process, initially, Ask Me yeah. and SEIU were fighting between themselves as to who could represent this Basically. group that didn't want anybody to represent right. them, and when that fighting got fierce. They were forced to have a general election yeah. where people could choose to vote either for AFSCME or SEIU. Is that right? Yes. And meanwhile, Pamela Harris uh, recognized what was going on. She banded together with other parents. They managed to put together uh, a, a campaign against the union. Uh -huh. They managed to get the message out to uh, to other parents uh, uh, what exactly was at stake in this vote, and that it was a, that it was an honest to God election. Uh, and when the votes were counted, they, they, they sent out a, a mail ballot, and when the votes were counted, uh, let's see, off the top of my head, I think it was something like 220 voted for Ask Me, 293, I want to say, voted for uh, SEIU, and 1,018 or some, somewhere just north of 1,000. Uh, voted for no union at all. So the, the, the anti-union, the, the, the non-union vote was two to one against oh, right. either of those two right. unions. And 
And so then it stops, right? Then, then, then Pam can just go back to taking care of well, her kid. No, not stop exactly. Him? What not exactly. Uh, well, typically, what the uh, what the rule is is you have to wait another year. Uh -huh. But the union could have come back if they'd wanted to, and and when got more s more signatures, and tried and for another tried right. for another election. Maybe one of the two, uh, maybe they'd work out an, a deal. So, so that Pam one decided of the two of them to go aside. to court. She decided to get yes. a lawyer and go to court. Yes, yeah, she went to uh, she went and, and got an attorney through the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation and. Uh, and they they filed a suit uh, in, in federal court, and it's gone all the way up through the federal courts to the uh, U.S. Did, Supreme Court. So now. did they want when they filed the suit? Did they want a declaratory judgment that said this whole procedure is kind of wacky? Uh, in legal terms, uh, not as I put it. Yeah, I, I don't know what the Latin term for wacky is, but uh, <laughs> but uh, basically, yes. Uh, uh, they actually did, they, did they win when they filed it? You know, was it in federal court or state court? Or well, they filed in federal court, court I believe, okay. but uh, th they. They haven't won yet. They've had but to initially, take it all the way up. Before you get to the Supreme Court, I assume mm -hmm. they filed either in district court on the federal level yeah. or in circuit court on the yeah. state level. Mm -hmm. So U.S. Probably U.S. district court, court, and then it went to the federal the court, of court of appeals. I think it's did they win district. in the district court, Pam Harris? No, I they don't believe there. they did. So the district court decided for the union, essentially, mm -hmm. that these folks had the right to go and, s and require Pam to vote right. for or against the union. Right. Okay. And then the appellate court, did they side with they the district would have court? Voted, they would have uh, voted, uh, I'm sorry, they, they would have decided against Pamela Harris because she was the yeah. one who had to appeal, okay. file the appeal to so the So she's US lost court. twice in the courts. Right. And now she's filed a petition, I guess for certiorari, which means the mm -hmm. Supreme Court doesn't have to take the case, but they did decide to take it. Right. So they thought there's an important matter of federal jurisdiction that, here. That's right. And that's where it sits now as we're taping this, because it was argued in the federal, in the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah, in back in January. In January, mm -hmm. by Pam's lawyers and by the union, union's lawyers mm -hmm. defending that yep. lower court decision. And we're waiting here, and you're virtually certain, we're certain, that in the next week or two, the U.S. Supreme Court will either rule for or against Pam Harris. Definitely by the end of this month, anyway. By the end of this month. Uh, okay. I, I don't know exactly when it could be. It could be as late as the thirtieth, but uh, definitely by the end of this uh, end of this month, the Supreme Court term ends on the. And you're in the Illinois Policy Institute, right? You're right. director of labor policy. Yep. So you're you're out there doing what you're doing, even as we talk. You're mm -hmm. on TV. You're telling people about these issues. You're involved in advocacy. Would that be fair? Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. And you write. People can find out more about what you do and what you've written at IllinoisPolicy.org, right? Yep. You go out speaking and so forth. Yes. It's part of what you do. Mm hmm Okay. You've been doing this for about 25 years. By this, by I mean advocacy. Uh, this sort of advocacy for, uh, oh, shoot, uh, yeah, about 20, 25 years. Because you started out at the University of Michigan and got your undergraduate degree there. Mm hmm then a law degree mm -hmm. at the University of Illinois, right? Yeah. Now, most people come out, they get a law degree, and if they're interested in labor, it sounds like you might have been interested in labor issues, right? Might have been, yeah. And so what people hear is, you know, if you get your law degree and you're going to go to work at a law firm, there's some law firms that are plaintiff, mm -hmm. so-called employer-oriented, mm -hmm. and then there's some law, law firms that are management-oriented. Right. You tend not to do both because there's conflicts, right? Well, the, the, there's I don't mean you, but the law yeah, firms well, tend to divide along those lines. There's a, there's a third in, in labor law. The, the, the there's way a third it's set way. There's up, a third yeah, way. there's a third force that's completely lost, and that is the the, the individual workers. They, they get very short shrift. I see. Uh, the, every it, the whole thing is is based on the idea that there's this battle between unions who be, between unions and employers and individual workers. Especially those who disagree with the union for whatever reason really just get lost in the shuffle there, and in this case, Pamela Harris's case actually sort of I is an illustration of just how bad it can get, because they're so lost in the shuffle that we don't. We're now we're not even organizing employees. We're we're organizing families basically. We call them employ. We we call them right. employees, but they're not. I just yeah. I wanted to bring that out because people may know about this division we're talking about, which lawyers would think of coming mm -hmm. out of law school. But in a sense, you're not taught in law school. There's this third force. Mm -hmm. There are families, individuals who are potentially employees, but not necessarily. Or maybe they're employees who differ from the way unions are representing them. Where do they go? Because they're not going to go to the management side. They're not going to go to the plaintiff side. Mm -hmm. They're going to go to the LI Policy Institute and other, other not-for-profit 
501c4s that are involved in advocacy, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. There just aren't a whole well, lot of... Are there other organizations that do what kind of what you do? That well, I mean, well there's, can you name some? There's groups in other in other states, Mackinac Center up in Michigan. You work uh, for them, right? I work with, I, I did a stint yeah. with them. Um, there's, there's, there's actually a network of, of state-based think tanks. Right, and many to, of them right do to work organizations? National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation you, you out you of work Virginia. For them? Yeah. I did a stint with them too, okay. yes. And uh, so there are groups. But then but there are groups on the other side, to be fair. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like Mexican American Legal Defense Fund and so forth. Or maybe they're doing other things. Yeah, I, But I, there I, are some employee. What are the plaintiffs' ones on the employees that you oppose? Like who's handling this case uh, for Pat Quinn, so to speak? In the Supreme well, Court. The, uh, well, the I guess the, does he have the Attorney General handling the this Attorney case? General has the State of the Illinois. Lisa Madigan. So every at least Madigan is out there trying to give Pam Harris a tough time. Is that essentially right? Uh, well, that's Pat sort of Quinn her job. By, yeah. But yeah, the, yeah, she's doing it, and she's, she's well. Doing she could it with, say, as a matter of conscience, stuff. look, didn't Thoreau say when the when the laws are unjust, the place for the just is in jail? So if if you're the Attorney General of the State of Illinois, and you're forced, or not forced, you're asked to go out and argue a case that you don't believe in, you might be able to say, well, I'm going to send somebody other, uh, at least send somebody else from my office. Because mm -hmm. even though a lawyer sometimes argues things mm -hmm. they don't believe in, but mm -hmm. in this kind of thing, you might say it's a matter of conscience. Well, you know, it, it's... I it, don't mean to put pressure yeah. on the Attorney General, but Lisa, if you're watching this, come on the show and tell us. You know, how did you feel? Was it a matter of conscience? Were you just doing your job, or did you really think that you know, Pat Harris deserved a whack or two. <laughs> I mean, am I being too tough? No, uh, I, well, uh, you know, it, it sort of is her job. And I, if I remem memory serves, she actually had one of her assistants write the actual brief. And the the argument was was done by uh, by somebody from the federal go from the federal uh -huh. Department of Labor, I believe. But uh, but so it was a team effort. Yeah, there were a lot of people ganging up on Pam Harris. There was the U.S. Department of Labor. There was the Illinois Attorney General's office. There's somebody in her office. Maybe somebody from the National Labor Relations Board. But Pam's really got a lot of tough enemies out there, doesn't she? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the first the first uh, enemy that she has, uh, the and first Pat problem Quinn. is the, is the service Quinn. employees international union. Well, union. But, but the SEIU really couldn't do much here without Pat Quinn and his executive order, right? Uh, probably not, because yeah. uh, the labor boards in Illinois even had a, bef had before. Okay before this ruled that, that uh, people like Pam Harris were not employees. Anything else before we go on to the next topic? Uh, well, I, I think the, the other interesting question that the Supreme Court is going to have to decide is whether or not government employees should be forced to pay union dues at all. This, uh, this case really sets up, really points out the perversity of forced union dues because workers can be forced to support a union that they don't believe in Unions really have an incentive to, to force themselves into places where they're not really wanted. So that's like, it's a difference between paying dues for the, u the union to, say, do collective bargaining for mm -hmm. you, when it's clear you want to be a member of the union, you want right. to engage in collective bargaining, but then they also do advocacy, which you right. might say they shouldn't be allowed to use their dues for, because how do they know on advocacy whether their union member wants them to or not? Is that what you mean? That, uh, that's a big part of it, yes. Yeah. Uh, the, qu the, the point is, nobody should be forced to join a private organization that they don't believe in, do not support, and do isn't really working in their best interests. Right now, is that what right to life, right, right to work, right is, to work about. is about? Yeah, that would be what. Because right in to right to work, you have a unionized company, and say you want to go there, but you don't want to join the union. Right. If you don't have a right to work law in that state, you have to. Right. So right to work means. Yes, you can work there, and yes, you can opt out from joining the union, and yes, you can opt out mm -hmm. from paying fees. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't actually expect the Supreme Court to go that far, but it is yeah. something that they've been asked to look at, and we're hoping that at the very least they will uh, they will decide Pamela Harris is not an employee. She should not be forced to, to uh, pay dues to a union. She should not have to worry about having a union, and that the Supreme Court will open the door to looking at forced dues in general down the road. We only have about four minutes left, so we're going to have to have Paul back so we can cover all <laughs> these issues. Others, but we want to touch on what went on in Wisconsin mm -hmm. with Scott Walker, where things are. Do you think you can wrap that up for us and tie a bow on it in well, four minutes? Well, sure. Uh, what happened, uh, what's, what Ill people in Illinois should, should pay attention to. 
The, is Illinois, uh, Wisconsin is, is, uh, is a state where they did a dramatic labor law reform. They did two things. First of all, they said that government employees could not be for forced to pay dues to a union that they don't believe in. And they also put a lot of limits on the scope of collective bargaining, which means that local officials are able to put in reforms like uh, teacher merit pay. Uh, without having to, p uh, to, play, uh, to play mother may I with union officials. And the reforms have, have really done a, gr a world of good for, for Wisconsin. Uh, they went f their budget went from a $2 billion deficit to a $1 billion surplus. Local governments have been able to save money, and government employees have actually benefited a little from it too. They don't have to worry anywhere near as much from it, we found, about layoffs after these reforms because the, the price of having uh, public employees is a lot more realistic. They don't have to worry so much about, uh, about layoffs. It really was a win all around. Because some of these costs that the unions are imposing are making it such that the state has to hire fewer people. Well, what uh, it was interesting, uh, Wisconsin, what uh, Governor uh, Walker said before he, uh, before he proposed this um, was, and I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the unions out. Of, out I'm going to get rid of the, the middleman. The state will save money on, reven on revenue sharing, and we will balance our budget that way. The local governments will lose the revenue sharing, but they'll be made even because they won't have to pay as much for employees because they won't have to go through the collective bargaining process. The government employees will lose a little bit in salaries because they won't have the union bargaining for them, but, they will say, but they'll get a good chunk of that back because they won't have to pay union dues. You cut out a middleman that hasn't been doing a whole lot of good, that's been doing more damage, than, more harm than good, and it just becomes a lot easier to balance everything else. And how's it working out in terms of the economy, the unemployment rate? Have you looked at that in Wisconsin relative to Well, Illinois? Wisconsin in particular has saved public employees has saved public employee jobs in particular. Okay. Uh, that's the, the one surprising thing. Uh, public employment was dropping because local governments in the state were, were forced to, uh, to lay off people to deal with the, the cost of, of, uh, of having government employees around. With the reform in place, uh, public sector employment ha has actually s steadied, and the state is a actually able to offer residents something in the neighborhood of $500 million in, in tax relief. Now, where do people find out more about what you're doing in the Illinois Policy Institute? Well, uh, you can see everything you want to know about Pamela Harris' case and also our report on the Wisconsin reforms at uh, our website, www.illinoispolicy.org. And they can sign up for daily emails? Uh, daily emails, uh, blog, we have, uh, w you know, we have in news on government reform, transparency, education, economics, labor. What's uh, the unifying theme for the Illinois Policy Institute? Well, uh, it is, is there one? Well, it, it, it is that uh, is that uh, defending. I like to call it defending the free society, defend and 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 with it free markets. Uh, there are free market solutions to most of Illinois' problems. We argue. We uh, make the case for. Are it. you a liberty-oriented think tank? Yes, uh, I uh, free market-oriented. Liberty, think tank. free, free market-oriented yeah. think tank. John Tillman would agree with that. He's uh, your. He's the what. Chairman or the CEO of the Illinois Policy Institute? Yes. So you guys all, would you, are you libertarian, would you say? Um, uh, I believe that the, the, the term that John likes to use is liberty principles. And what does it mean by liberty principles? Well, uh, uh, allowing people the, the, the most flexibility and the most freedom to, op to, uh, to pursue their own interests, their own hopes, their own goals, their own dreams. Thank you so much. Paul Kersey, Director of Labor Policy at the Illinois Policy Institute. Don't be a stranger. Come back here. Tell Diane to be here. Ted Dabrowski, <laughs> John Tillman, all of you. Okay. I'll pass that along. Make sure. Okay. Because what you're doing is important, and we're not taking sides. We'll have liberals on. We've had Ralph Mortieri from the Center for Tax and Budget mm -hmm. Accountability. We want to have these clash of ideas. Mm -hmm. We want to have conservatives. We want to have liberals. We want to have free markets and whatever is opposed to free markets.